Well, let's have a word of prayer this morning as we get started. Father, we thank you again for another good day. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us. Lord, this week, Lord, you've been so gracious to us. Lord, we thank you for watching over us. We thank you for protecting us. We thank you, Lord, for, Lord, the blessings of life. Lord, we thank you, Lord, so very much that you, you love us. Lord, we thank you for this time of the year. And, Lord, we remember the birth of the Messiah. Lord, I'm always reminded of Andrew said to Peter, we have found the Messiah, which is by interpretation of Christ. The men of, of Samaria said, now we believe not because of thy words, but we have heard him ourselves and believe that this is the Christ, the Son of God. Lord, we thank you for this time of the year. Lord, we pray again for our Sunday school hour. We pray that you'll bless our time, give us clearness of thought, give us direction. Lord, bless in the few minutes that we have. Lord, really, our time will go by rather rapidly and we shall be on our way home. Lord, I, again, I thank you so very much, Lord, for allowing us to be here, Lord, on this cold December morning. Uh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for the heat and the warmth of the building. Thank you, Lord, for all my brothers and sisters. I thank you for the church today, for the saints of God that are here. Father, I pray, Lord, for uh, Brother Pete's uh, uh, service tomorrow. God, you gave him a long life. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, through his death, Lord, through his passing, Lord, we know that whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Lord, we cannot imagine. Lord, we can try to imagine, but we cannot imagine the glory that heaven holds for us, the beauty and the wonder, Lord, that it holds for us. What people in heaven are doing right now, Lord, I... I, I pray tomorrow that, Lord, maybe somebody would hear the gospel, and, Lord, that they might trust Jesus because of Pete. Lord, we thank you again, uh, Lord, for your mercy to us. Bless us now, we pray, in these few minutes, in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. All right, uh, I left my glasses back there, Ryan, right by those flowers on that uh, thing right there. Are they there? Okay, so there aren't any glasses there. I've got a pair, though. I hate wearing these, but anyway. I know I had those glasses, but... Um, all right, we'll get started today. We'll do this. I didn't give anybody a chance last week because somebody had asked a question previously, but anybody got a question today, Ryan? From the body present with God. Right. Um, but I'm thinking more like in regards, this happened with Jessica, so I'm just curious. If God knows it's her time or someone's time, the second they, um, before they start working on them to try to revive them, you think they're already in heaven because he knows they're not coming back? That's logical to me. Okay, moving on. All right, if you're asking my opinion, here, okay, this is, my, this is mine. If you're dead, dead, not mostly dead, but dead, dead, you're not coming back, and you're in, you're in heaven. I have, in my, one of my books, Testimonies of, Dying Testimonies of the Lost and Saved. Uh, it's not so much now anymore, because usually when people die now, they have them so doped up, they don't even know they're dying. Uh, but before, uh, and I, somebody just said this this week. So I, I heard somebody say this. I didn't, did not comment, did not say anything. I'll give you two instances of this. Somebody told me once that when their grandmother was dying, she literally was climbing up the headboard of her bed screaming, the devils are here to get me. Uh, Someone said this week that some relative of theirs, grandmother, something, was dying, was in the bedroom screaming, uh, don't let me die, don't let me die. Uh, when Voltaire died, who was an atheist, when Voltaire died, he was one of the most noted atheists of the 19th century. Uh, hated God, hated 
um, Christ and on his deathbed as he's dying, he's screaming, oh, most merciful Christ, have mercy upon me. Uh, people, on the other hand, I really believe this. I've said this about, um, probably you would know her name. You, you were, some of you will remember this. Her name was Kathy. And uh, she was saved, and uh, I only knew her a little bit. She was from New Jersey or something. Her mom and dad lived up here, and she came up here and had cancer and was dying the night before she died. I know this, I know this to be true. The night before she died, that uh, in her darkened bedroom, it was dark because I went in there, and it was very, very dark. There were no lights in the room. She was... She had said to her mother, Mother, look at, you know, all the beautiful lights. And there, there were no lights. Curtis Hudson said, I don't, and whether, and I have no reason to doubt, Brother Curtis, that he had a man in his church who lived in a shack. It was a shack, and he went to visit him as he was dying. And he said to Brother Curtis, look at all the beautiful flowers. And again, I remind you, the Bible says this about, Paul said, I knew a man, was it 15 years ago, whether in the body or not, I cannot tell, but he said he was caught up to the paradise of God. We often call the Garden of Eden paradise, and the paradise of God, the Bible, we know this, says that, that on either side of the river blooms a tree of life, which bears 12 manner of fruit, uh, uh, a different fruit every month, and I've said before, the word paradise means beautiful gardens that sometimes we, we think of heaven as a very sterile place, streets of gold, uh, mansions, uh, beautiful foundations to the city. But to answer your question, Ryan, I believe that people, I believe that people who are dying sometimes, again, I've read so many testimonies of dying saved people that as they're dying, they, they see their relatives. They call their relatives by name. And I, I've said this, that when, one of the things that happens when we die is that we meet people that we have known in this life. Uh, now, the book had nothing to do with heaven. But Mitch Album wrote a book, The First Five People You Meet in Heaven. Well, I believe that we will meet people and I've read testimonies of people who were dying, who saw people they knew and called them by name, that in heaven we will be who we are. Uh, when we get there, of course, we'll be somewhat, we'll be changed, we'll be somewhat different. But to answer your question, Ryan, even if people, look, if you're mostly dead and they revive you, I don't think that you were really dead. Uh, I know that people give, te well, I was floating above my body and I saw this beautiful light at the end of a tunnel and all, all that. And, okay, I, the only thing I can explain about that is that Satan is the angel of light. He is transformed to an angel of light. And that when what people see, I do not know, I, I can't tell you. Uh, that guy that wrote that book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. How do you explain that? Well, I can't explain it. I do not think, I do not believe he was in heaven. If he, if he was, it was contrary to the word of God, and, and that just, because Paul said that he heard things. He didn't necessarily say, and that's what he said. He said, I heard things which are not lawful to be other, uttered. Now, what he saw, we have no idea, but he heard things. And this guy said he went to heaven, and he came back, and he wrote, he wrote this book. Again, I've said before, most of what I read in that book, I read in the Bible. He did not give me anything that I did not already know. And so, to answer your question, I believe that people, as they are dying, I believe as they are dying, I believe saved people see heaven. I believe that. And again, we've, we've talked about where is heaven. I, I can only tell you that Mount Zion on the sides of the north, that we are, 
that, that heaven is somewhere that way. Now, whether it's right above us and we cannot see it, that it is hid from our eyes, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Uh, Hebrews 11 gives us all these, I forget how many it was, I think there are 30-some people mentioned. It may not be that many, but then he says in chapter 12, verse 1, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the sin and the weight which thus so easily beset us, that again, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. There's rejoicing in the presence. The angels do not rejoice. But there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repenteth. So it is evident that to some degree, and I cannot, I, I would not hazard how much, that to some degree people in heaven have some idea about what is happening here. Now, to what degree, I do not know, which then leads us, well, how far is heaven? Well, it's close enough that from the time Mary Magdalene saw Jesus and he said, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, and a half hour later, the women returning from the tomb grabbed him around the ankles. He evidently ascended to heaven and came back in that amount of time. So uh, where it is, uh, you know, Anyway, so I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I, I believe that when you are dead, dead, that you're not coming back, and that I believe that you are in heaven already. I believe you're there. They may try to revive you, but I believe that you're already there. So that's my, based on the Bible, that would be my opinion. So, okay. Anybody else got a question? You got a question about anything? Lou? Go reading in the book of Numbers about this guy that all he did was pick up some sticks on the Sabbath and they ended up stoning him to death. And I was, it just occurred to me how blessed we are not to be under that law that you probably couldn't even keep track of all the things you had to, you know, all the rules. <laughs> Here, you know what, here's, and, and it's true. Uh, I read this, there are 17,000 pages of laws in America. And the reason there are 17,000 is because we failed to keep 10 simple lines in the Bible. But there were like, it's either 662 or 663 Old Testament law. Like you can't work on the Sabbath. Uh, and we are under the moral law. Thou shalt not kill, steal, lie. Uh, we are under the moral law that the, the ceremonial law you know, you can't mix cotton and wool. You can't mix, mix fabrics. You can't put a mule and an and a ox in the same yoke. Uh, there are all kinds of things. Uh, it's like you couldn't eat, I think it was, you couldn't eat fish with, without scales. I think that's what it was. You couldn't eat fish without scales. Uh, and boy, that would, boy, I, I, I don't like fish. I, I like saltwater fish. And freshwater fish are okay, uh, but boy, catfish are really good. And they don't have scales. And uh, they are good. And if you make them with hush puppies, coleslaw, and french fry, how you got a meal right there. But anyway, and, but you couldn't do that. And uh, pork, no go, but, but you're right. How difficult. Uh, the key. And, and it's like uh, the manna. If you went out and picked your manna for the day and you said, well, I'm going to pick some for tomorrow, the next morning it was full of worms and it was rotten, except on Friday. The manna you picked up on Friday, you were not to pick any up on Saturday. The Friday you picked up enough for Saturday too, and it stayed good. I mean, that's how, how God is. God is very gracious. But to try and keep, and that's what Paul objected to, to the Galatians, in the Galatians. Paul objected to the fact that there were people, and, and in the book of Acts, they objected to the fact that the Jews were trying to force the Gentiles to live like Jews, and the Jews couldn't even live like Jews. And so 
yeah, it's uh, it is uh, a uh, I guess what he was saying that I'm glad that we do not live under the that law, that we live under the age of grace, and that that's what God God is. God is gracious. Look at Psalm 147 for a moment, and then if anybody else has a question, I hate these glasses, but Psalm 147. But I can read with them, so that's it's amazing. Some days I can read without glasses. Psalm 145. Some days I can read without glasses, and other days I can't. Verse 8. Here's a description of God. The Lord is gracious. That's what God is. God is gracious. We say God is good. That is what God is. God is good. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. You and I have compassion sometimes, but not God. He is slow to anger and of great mercy. I believe it's Psalm, 1, it's Psalm 130 some that every verse ends with his mercy and joy forever. God is of great mercy. That's what God is. It says great mercy. The Lord is good, verse 9. The Lord is good to all. I've said before that this, I believe God's good to everybody. I believe he's good to the lost and he's good to the saved. Um, and I, I believe that God in his great mercy and great compassion at times, while he is under no obligation to answer a prayer of a lost person, that God in his mercy and his great compassion does sometimes. God does that. Psalm, I mean, Luke 6 and verse 35 says that he is kind even to the evil and unthankful. God is kind to them because God is of great compassion. Now, he is under obligation to take care of his children. David said this, I am old. He said, but one thing I have never seen, the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Uh, God is of great compassion to us and of, of tender mercy to us. And he is good to all. As it says there in verse 9, the Lord is, is good to all and his tender mercies over all his works. Your idea of God, I, I'll, say, I'll, I'll say this, I've said it, and, you know, you say a lot of things after 40 years, but there are, uh, I believe that you are a product of what you were as a kid. Uh, I, I, you know, I hesitate to say this, but I said one time, I said to my father, I don't grow up to be like you. I was a rebellious teenager. I don't grow up to be like you. And my wife says to me all the time, you're just like your father, you know. I was like, so now I was noticing. And you know what? That's a compliment now. I see that as a great thing, that and that's what you are. And, and a lot of times, our idea of God is in direct relationship to what our, I, our relationship with our earthly father was like. If your father was standoffish and, and cold and harsh, a lot of times we have the idea that's what God is. If your father was very kind and gracious and loving and tender-hearted toward you, then that's our idea of God. But I believe the second idea of God is, is what's important, that God is of great compassion, tender mercy, and he is good to all. That's what God is, that God loves people. Why do you think, I'll ask you a question. Why do you think that God, okay, I'll, let me say this real quick. Of all the Ten Commandments, the only one that Christ did not repeat was the one of remember the Sabbath day. He gave all the other nine he brought out. Why do you think that God said that on the Sabbath day you shall do no servile work? Why did God say that? What? He created the seventh day. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. What did God do on the seventh day? He rested. It's what he did. I think they found out during World War II that working seven days a week, pro productivity dropped. Uh, I know that now, and some of you remember, I know some of you remember, because I can remember. 
uh, they used to have blue laws where no stores were open on Sunday. Businesses weren't open on Sunday. Look, I understand farmers got to milk the cows. I understand that. Uh, and God understands that. But God made a day. Uh, Jesus said to the disciples, come ye apart and rest a while. My old preacher, Don McKnight, you say, if you don't come apart, you'll come apart. And uh, so, look, God is good. He's gracious. God knows that we need a day off. That's what we need. So he, he made this law. He said, remember the Sabbath day. One, because God made the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. But, and he, he wanted the, the Jews to worship him. It was a day of, of rest. Boy, some of their Sabbaths were feast days. I mean, they, they, they just let her, they had feast and, and uh, because God is good. And he wants us to, he wants us to have a day where we rest. That's what he wants us to do. So I uh, uh, am, uh, I believe that. Anybody else got an answer? Why did God create? Yeah. All right, anybody else got an answer to why God made the Sabbath day? And this is what Jesus said when the Pharisees got mad. They waited to see if he would eat on the Sabbath. And he said, I'm going to, I know I'm going to mix this up. But he said this, uh, man was, the Sabbath, I think he said the Sabbath is not made for man, but man for the Sabbath, or just the opposite, one or the other. But because the Pharisees were mad because Jesus healed that man. I've said this before. Now, the Sabbath day about working, that the Jews came up with 39 different laws concerning work on the Sabbath day. And one of the laws they made, two, I remember two. One, you could not heal on the Sabbath. It was against the Jewish law to heal somebody on the Sabbath. So the man that had the withered hand, he said, put forth thy hand. He put it forth. He healed him on the Sabbath day. The Jews got mad. Because he healed, they said it's against the law to do that. And then one of the other 39 laws was, you couldn't carry your bed on the Sabbath day. Who makes a law like that? But you remember the man by the pool of Bethesda, 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 five porches. He healed that man, and the man picked up his bed and carried it, and the Jews got mad. He said, well, why would they get mad? It was against the law. It was against the law to carry your bed on the Sabbath day. And Jesus said that, look, the Sabbath was not made for. Anyway, you look it up, you'll see what it says there anyway. So, all right, Connie. I was curious to talk a little bit last Sunday about uh, um, departing from the faith. And I was curious, why do we have so many, in your opinion, different denominations, Protestant denominations? You want the real truth? Yeah. Okay, here, here's, here's what I believe. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, don't stone me. Hey, John was a... I don't know if he was or not. I just like to throw that out. But anyway. Okay, the first church at, at the church at Jerusalem, I hope, I pray, that we're a great deal like they are. I'm sure we probably fail a lot of things. Church history is really interesting. My brother goes to a Greek Orthodox church or a Russian Orthodox. I don't even know which one it is, but I, I read one of their guys one time, and he said that the Greek Orthodox is the, the true church. And they, uh, uh, I think it was J.M. or J.B. J. Carroll wrote a book called The Trail of Blood, which he traces the, the church today back to the apostles. There, there have always been people like us. They, they, the, the term Baptist, a Baptist church, really did not originate until like 1680. They, they were not called Baptist. They were called Anabaptists because they rebaptized people. But there were people who were similar in faith to what you and I believe. They... Uh, they went by different names, the, the, the Huguenots in France, the Lollards, the, the Donatists were really on like the 3rd and 4th century, the Waldenses, and, and they believed a great deal like us. All right. 
the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. The, the one church that was prevalent was the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they ruled. Henry VIII, of course, wanted to divorce his wife, and the church wouldn't let him, so he broke off, started the Anglican Church, which is the Catholic Church in name only, uh, in a different name. But in, in October of 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 Theses to the church door of Wittenberg. He is credited as being the father of the Reformation. There were other guys like um, Zurich Swingley and John Calvin and uh, uh, Martin Luther and John Knox. But Protestant comes from the word protest. So we, that they protested the Catholic Church. The thing about Luther is this, that in, in the Peasant War, it was basically the Protestants against the Catholics that Luther took the Catholic side and actually persecuted the Protestants. The, Luther's great discovery, and it wasn't so great because there were many people, the church has never disappeared. Luther's great discovery was the just shall live by faith. Uh, he, as a, as a, he was a Dominican monk. They would find him unconscious in his room from beating himself, trying to appease his conscience toward God. And he never could until he found that verse, which you and I all know, the just shall live by faith. Uh, the Lutherans are a result of Martin Luther. I've been in their churches before. Uh, Wayne and I went out uh, to Kansas, and there are big Lutherans out that way, and the guy's farm we were hunting on took me over to his church. I was amazed at how... Uh, formalistic, ritualistic, they were. Uh, the Presbyterians, John Knox, you know, they are very strong Calvinist. Uh, the Methodists were started by John Wesley because they were methodical in their Bible study and praying. Hence, they called them Methodists. Um, the Episcopal Church is, is basically an offshoot of the Anglican Church in America. Uh, and while I would agree with many things the Presbyterians believe, and I would agree with many things that Wesley believed, uh, someone asked Spurgeon one time that he think he would see Wesley in heaven because Wesley, uh, they believe you can lose your salvation. And, you know, Spurgeon said, no, I do not believe I'll see him. And the guy said, I, don't, I didn't think so either. But then Spurgeon said, I believe that I won't see him because he'll be so close to the throne that I won't see him. Look, there are heresies that are among believers. There are damnable heresies that Peter speaks about, that, that they are... Uh, that's what they are. They're damnable. They'll keep people out of heaven. But in my, my opinion is that, you know, I believe this, Connie. If, if you're asking me, I'll, I'll just say this. Two things. One, all these Protestant churches are an offshoot from the Roman Catholic Church. Because all those people, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, all came out of the Catholic Church. And they brought a lot of things. For example... The Lutherans and the Presbyterians believe that in the Lord's table, it literally becomes the body and the blood of Christ. I don't believe that. So, you know, but are there Presbyterians? I've known some great Presbyterian guys that uh, were, were great. That, that guy, that song, One Day, J. Wilbur Chapman, wrote One Day When Heaven Was Filled. That guy was a Presbyterian. Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, was a Presbyterian. D.L. Moody was a congregationalist. Uh, th th we would agree with a lot of things. They And there were just some things. And, and there are probably, look, 
there are people today called Baptist briders. By that, they believe that only the Baptist are, uh, uh, are the bride of Christ. Now look, I think anybody that, I've said this before, if a person realizes they're a sinner and they're willing to call upon Christ and Christ alone to save them, I don't care what church you're going to, when you realize you're a sinner in Christ and Christ alone, I believe that you're saved. Well, the Baptist briders would say, well, they're not part of the bride of Christ. They may be the friends, but they're not part. I don't believe that's true. I believe that there was a guy that visited us not long ago, and he said, I almost didn't come to your church. I said, really? Yeah, he said, because you didn't have Baptist in your name. I said, really? There was a guy in Watertown who wouldn't have anything to do with us because we didn't have Baptist in our name. Now, we have on our sign an independent Baptist church, but our church is Calvary Bible Church. And I understand that there is a, a bad kind of connotation to Bible churches. I know that, but we're not going to change. I mean, we're not going to do that. But, but so and as, as I see church history, what happened is that the Protestant Reformation came along and that many, many churches, many churches were started out of the Catholic Church and brought many of their doctrines with them. Uh, but the one about justification by faith, of course, is uh, uh, accursed in the Catholic Church. They do not believe that. They believe that, they believe that the Bible and that the church and that the Pope, uh, I mean, the Pope came out the other day and said he didn't believe there was a hell. I mean, come on. Now, but, you know, he speaks as the vicar of Christ, so he says, well, I don't believe there's a hell. And, I mean, that's contrary to what the Bible says. But again, that, that is why. And, um, and the Campbellites, the Church of Christ, which is really prevalent in the South, are Campbellites. And, and, and if you went to one of their churches, you would say, wow, but there's two things about them. One, the Campbellites believe you've got to be baptized to go to heaven. They take Mark 16, except you, re what does that verse say? Except you, look at Mark 16 for a minute. I know what it says, and you do too. Mark 16. They'll take this verse, and they'll take the verse from Acts. My friend Randy and I, we were having a revival in San Angelo, Texas. And so we had a bunch of posters we were taking around. We went to a store, and the guy was very interested until he asked, well, what do you think about Acts chapter 2? And accept, uh, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And he was a church of Christ. -er. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, and fortunately, Randy was uh, pretty stupid, still am, but repent and be baptized because of the remission of sins. Our sins have been remitted, so repent and be baptized because of that. Mark chapter 16, it says this in verse uh, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. See, the Campbellites take that verse to mean that you have got to, as it says in that verse, except um, he that believeth. One, you've got to believe, and secondly, you've got to be baptized. And the Campbellites started their church on that verse. And the Church of Christ, which is what they are, in the South is like everywhere. I mean, they're like everywhere. And the second thing, they, they believe that you can lose your salvation. They, they believe that. And they, they believe it to the point where um, Brother Dewey, there's a guy down there who has a radio program, and uh, Brother Dewey called him up one day, and... and um, he asked him a question, well, have you ever done this in your heart? Well, yeah. Then Brother Dewey said, well, then you must have been lost. Well, no, 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 not brother. But it's like they believe you lose your salvation. They believe you lose it every time you sin. But anyway, so. But that is my idea. That is, that is how I see it. Uh, I, I would, I believe in the security of the believer. The, the word Baptist, we've taken as an acronym, 
we believe the Bible is true. Well, Methodist, a, a Bible-believing Methodist will believe the Bible's true. Okay, great. We believe in the autonomy of the church. In other words, we are a local New Testament church that we, we are it. We don't belong to some uh, other convention. Uh, we believe in the autonomy of the church. Uh, I can't remember what the T is, but the T is for the two ordinances. We believe in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, we believe in the, uh, I can't remember all it is. I had it written down somewhere once, but, and I, I think we, we try to do those things. Uh, I know one is, one was brother, uh, when th brother Tom was here, he had that thing on soul liberty. We believe in soul liberty. Look, if you want to die and go to hell, pal, that's your business. I'm not going to force you to be a Christian. Uh, that's what we believe by soul. And, and, and in soul liberty also, we believe this, that, um, that we have liberty in Christ. Uh, is there, I'm just, no, I don't want to do that. I was going to ask, is there anybody in here who does not have a Christmas tree? By conviction. Doug, okay. Oh, well, you raised your hand. Oh, it's not up yet. Oh, okay, I got it, all right. Um, well, neither is mine, so we're in the same boat. But there, there are people who do not believe in Christmas trees. Okay, fine. Brother, you got the liberty to believe that. If you don't believe that, that's okay. I'll give you the liberty to believe that you, you, don't, you don't think of Christmas. But give me the liberty to believe that it's okay, you know? And that can apply to anything. Again, the Bible is full of principles that we live by. They're, I've said before, you know, that in the North, we, we're really hard on tobacco. Uh, down South, you know, they're not. Well, you know, if you got the liberty, I'm not, we don't have liberty to sin. I'm just, I'm saying that we, and we're trying to f draw a line somewhere, but we're just, we believe in soul liberty. That's one of the things about, yeah. So, so when you have, when I'm so curious about, you know, when you have the Nazarenes and right. God, Assembly of God and the Mennonites right. and whatnot, is it just their doctrinal differences, why yeah. people choose them, there. or is it personality types? Uh, well, the Assembly of God believe you can lose your salvation. We don't. They believe in, in, in uh, what I call miracle gift signs, speaking in tongues, and, and I don't. The Church of the Nazarene believes you can lose your salvation. Church of the Nazarene is a split off of the Methodist Church. Um, Methodists believe you can lose your salvation. A, a true what I would call Bible-believing, and there are Bible-believing. Uh, there are free Methodist churches. Hey, look, there are free will Baptist churches, which there are Seventh-day free will Baptist churches. They worship on Saturday. They, they believe you can lose your salvation. Uh, you know, I, I'll just say, how many... This is stupid. But I don't, how many, how many varieties of ketchup does Heinz have? How many varieties of ketchup does Heinz have? 57. How can you have 57 varieties of ketchup? No, different tomatoes. Thank you, Ken. 57 varieties of ketchup. I don't even like ketchup but anyway. But anyway, the same thing's true. Uh, Boy, they got all kinds of mustard you put on, on your hot dog. But anyway, the same thing's true about Baptist churches. I'll, I'll bet you find 30 different kind of Baptist churches. There's the American Baptist, the Southern Baptist, the Free Will Baptist, the Independent Baptist, the GARBC. I mean, you just, uh, the Baptist Bride, I mean, so most, most of these denominations, the Assembly of God, the Assembly of God, the Church of God, um, Church of God is more down south. 
I, I, I classify them as charismatic miracle sign churches. They believe in losing your salvation. The Methodists believe that. The Church of the Nazarene believes that. Uh, there, there are churches, of course, we've talked about this before, there are churches that only believe that certain people can go to heaven. Brother, I believe whosoever will may come. Uh, Rye? I wonder if some of them might just stem from desire to have a church how you want it. Like um, the feel good churches. Like, I don't want to hear that how I'm living is wrong. Right. So I want to go to a church that tells, you know, all happiness and sunshine. Mm -hmm. So I can still say, well, I'm a church-going person. And brother, I mean sister, <laughs> you need to go to Joel Osteen's church then if you want to feel good church. No, like, uh, you know, or Jesse Jackson's church or somebody. I don't, I don't even know if Jackson has a church, but anyway. But yeah, probably. I like to think, and you say you're delusional. Yeah, I know that. I like to think that we're, we try to be pretty close to what the church at Jerusalem, the church at Antioch was. Probably more so the church at Antioch, simply because uh, the church at Jerusalem had, had some problems. And, and, um, but I like to think that. I, I do. So, Anybody else got a question, comment? Yes, ma'am. They, they are... Believe it or not, the Mennonites come from, I, I don't want to, okay, John Wesley and Charles Wesley are credited with the Methodist Church. Uh, Francis Asbury, uh, George Whitfield, though Whitfield and, and Wesley uh, broke fellowship, uh, they're, they're Methodist. Uh, Menno Simons was the guy that is credited with the Mennonite Church. Uh, and they, I'll just give you this, then we'll, but one, one, of, one of our members that attends here faithfully, regularly, attended the Mennonite church for years. And somebody asked him one day, why are you coming over to that church, this church now? He says, he told him, he said, because I got saved. And that's why I go over to that church. And they said, well, you were saved in the Mennonite church. And he said to them, I was never saved in the Mennonite church. And he's told me before, he's never one time ever heard of real salvation. Now, maybe some of you have. I'm not trying to throw a blanket over everything. But they are, in, in many ways, a works-type salvation. Uh, now, you say, preacher, do you think there are any saved Mennonites? Well, sure. I think that some people are saved in spite of what they may have been taught after they were saved. Uh, again, salvation is, I'm a sinner, I'm lost. Christ died for my sins, paid those sins, and I will trust him. I've changed my, I've changed my course of thinking. Uh, I'm not going in that direction anymore. Uh, and... And he'll just, he'll tell you, if you ask him, he'll tell you, I wasn't saved when I went to the Mennonite church. And I've told him that. Yes, ma'am. She said the old, she said she could not ever believe the Baptist type of religion because they think you can always be saved. Right. And God forgives your sins, she says, and that is ridiculous. And she went to church every, every Sunday, I guess. And she also told us that the Mennonite religion came from the Amish, but they didn't want to stick to his, the rules of the Amish, so they kind of right. made up their own. And she said there was two types of Mennonites. Yes. The Mennonites that are really strict about everything you do, and then the Mennonite church she went to that was a little more progressive. That's what we need, a progressive church. Yeah. But it's like, um, so, uh, yeah, yes? We're going to an evangelical free church yeah. at that time. Yeah. And he said, look to a modern a Mennonite. Well, we attended a couple of them, and he never even opened the Bible or used a right. Bible verse. 
Right. So, I mean, I was looking for a Bible-believing church, and, you know, this is why we, we really love this church. Well, I'm, look, I'm, I'm not trying to be down on anybody, but I, I'm saying that if you believe, okay, I believe that Christ paid for all of our sins. The Bible makes it very clear that he has forgiven us of all our iniquity, that every sin we've ever committed and every sin we will ever commit is under the blood. I believe that. I believe that from the bottom of my heart. It, that, that, that is like really like, wow, preacher, every sin, every sin, every one. And to say that God has not forgiven you, and we talked about this last Sunday, to say that you got to do the best you can. Look, every guy in jail is doing the best he can. Kenny, you wanted to say something, you got to say it in a hurry, bud, because we're running out of time. The easiest way to tell the difference, in my opinion, is how that particular de denomination takes their view of Christ. And that's true. How do you view Christ? I watch, forgive me, I know you will, I like watching the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sing the first Noel. But when I watch them, I look at them and I think how sad it is that every one of them, you say, well, how do you know? Because they take a very weak view of the work of Christ. What Christ did on the cross paid our sins. So, well, we got to stop. People are coming in. Thank you for your questions today. Don't forget, no church tonight, viewing from 5 to 8. Father, we thank you again for your goodness to us today. Now, Lord, we thank you, for, Lord, for our thoughts in Sunday school. Lord, Sunday school is to learn. Lord, we need to learn. We need to be able to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that lieth within us. Why do we believe what we believe? Lord, it's not because the preacher said so, it's because the Bible says so. If any man desires to know the truth, he shall know it. And so, Lord, I pray you'll help us here, Lord, that we might know the truth, might use the Bible. Lord, I think of that song Pete and I used to sing, I'm using my Bible for a roadmap. Lord, I pray you'll help us to do that. Lord, bless the next hour, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.